The Byzantine Greeks or Byzantines were the Greek-speaking Christian Romans of late antiquity and the Middle Ages. They were the main inhabitants of the lands of the Byzantine Empire, Eastern Roman Empire, of Constantinople and Asia Minor, modern Turkey, the Greek islands, Cyprus, and portions of the Southern Balkans, and formed large minorities or pluralities in the coastal urban centers of the Levant and northern Egypt. Throughout their history, the Byzantine Greeks self-identified as Romans, Greek Romoioi translate Romoioi, but are referred to as Byzantines and Byzantine Greeks in modern historiography. The social structure of the Byzantine Greeks was primarily supported by a rural, agrarian base that consisted of the peasantry, and a small fraction of the poor. These peasants lived within three kinds of settlements, the Corian or village, the Agridian or hamlet, and the Prostion or estate. Many civil disturbances that occurred during the time of the Byzantine Empire were attributed to political factions within the empire rather than to this large popular base. Soldiers among the Byzantine Greeks were at first conscripted amongst the rural peasants and trained on an annual basis. As the Byzantine Empire entered the 11th century, more of the soldiers within the army were either professional men at arms or mercenaries. Until the 12th century, education within the Byzantine Greek population was more advanced than in the West, particularly at primary school level, resulting in comparatively high literacy rates. Success came easily to Byzantine Greek merchants, who enjoyed a very strong position in international trade. Despite the challenges posed by rival Italian merchants, they held their own throughout the latter half of the Byzantine Empire's existence. The clergy also held a special place, not only having more freedom than their Western counterparts, but also maintaining a patriarch in Constantinople who was considered the equal of the Pope. This position of strength had built up over time, for at the beginning of the Byzantine Empire, under Emperor Constantine the Great r. 306-337, only a small part, about 10%, of the population was Christian. Use of the Greek language was already widespread in the eastern parts of the Roman Empire when Constantine moved its capital to Constantinople, although Latin was the language of the imperial administration. From the reign of Emperor Heraclius r. 610 Greek was the predominant language amongst the populace and also replaced Latin in administration. At first, the Byzantine Empire had a multi-ethnic character, but following the loss of the non-Greek-speaking provinces with the 7th century Muslim conquests it came to be dominated by the Byzantine Greeks, who inhabited the heartland of the later empire, modern Cyprus, Greece, Turkey, and Sicily, and portions of southern Bulgaria, Crimea, and Albania. Over time, the relationship between them and the West, particularly with Latin Europe, deteriorated. Relations were further damaged by a schism between the Catholic West and Orthodox East that led to the Byzantine Greeks being labeled as heretics in the West. Throughout the later centuries of the Byzantine Empire and particularly following the imperial coronation of the King of the Franks, Charlemagne r. 768-814, in Rome in 800, the Byzantines were not considered by Western Europeans as heirs of the Roman Empire, but rather as part of an Eastern Kingdom made up of Greek peoples. As the Byzantine Empire declined, the Byzantines and their lands came under foreign domination, mostly Ottoman rule. The designation, Rum, for their Greek-speaking Orthodox subjects and Rum Millet, Roman nation, for all the Eastern Orthodox populations was kept both by Ottoman Greeks and their Ottoman overlords and lived on until the 20th century. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Terminology. During most of the Middle Ages, the Byzantine Greeks self-identified as Romoioi, Romo Romans meaning citizens of the Roman Empire, a term which in the Greek language had become synonymous with Christian Greeks. The Latinizing term Graikoi Greeks, was also used, though its use was less common, and non-existent in official Byzantine political correspondence, prior to the Fourth Crusade of 1204. While this Latin term for the ancient Hellenes could be used neutrally, its use by Westerners from the 9th century onwards in order to challenge Byzantine claims to ancient Roman heritage rendered it a derogatory exonym for the Byzantines who barely used it, mostly in contexts relating to the West, such as texts relating to the Council of Florence, to present the Western viewpoint. The ancient name Hellenes was synonymous to pagan in popular use, but was revived as an ethnonym in the Middle Byzantine period 11th century, while in the West the term Roman acquired a new meaning in connection with the Catholic Church and the Bishop of Rome, the Greek form 
Romoioi remained attached to the Greeks of the Eastern Roman Empire. The term Byzantines or Byzantine Greeks is an exonym applied by later historians like Hieronymus Wolff. The Byzantines continued to call themselves Romoioi Romans in their language. Despite the shift in terminology in the West, the Byzantines Greeks' eastern neighbors, such as the Arabs, continued to refer to the Byzantines as Romans, as for instance in the 30th surah of the Quran Ar -rum. The signifier, Roman, Rum Millet, Roman nation, was also used by the Byzantine Greeks' later Ottoman rivals, and its Turkish equivalent Rum, Roman, continues to be used officially by the government of Turkey to denote the Greek Orthodox natives Rumler of Istanbul, as well as the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople Turkish, Rum Orthodox Patrikanesi, Roman Orthodox Patriarchate, among Slavic populations of Southeast Europe, such as Bulgarians and Serbs the name, Romoioi, Romans, in their languages was most commonly translated as, Greki, Greeks. Some Slavonic texts during the early medieval era also used the terms Rimlyana or Rami. In medieval Bulgarian sources the Byzantine emperors were the Tsars of the Greeks, and the Byzantine Empire was known as Tsardom of the Greeks. Both rulers of the Despotate of Epirus and the Empire of Nicaea were also Greek Tsars ruling over Greek people. <laughs> Society. While social mobility was not unknown in Byzantium the order of society was thought of as more enduring, with the average man regarding the court of heaven to be the archetype of the imperial court in Constantinople. This society included various classes of people that were neither exclusive nor immutable. The most characteristic were the poor, the peasants, the soldiers, the teachers, entrepreneurs, and clergy. The poor. According to a text dated to AD 533, a man was termed poor if he did not have 50 gold coins aurei, which was a modest though not negligible sum. The Byzantines were heirs to the Greek concepts of charity for the sake of the polis, nevertheless it was the Christian concepts attested in the Bible that animated their giving habits, and specifically the examples of Basil of Caesarea who is the Greek equivalent of Santa Claus, Gregory of Nyssa, and John Chrysostom. The number of the poor fluctuated in the many centuries of Byzantium's existence, but they provided a constant supply of muscle power for the building projects and rural work. Their numbers apparently increased in the late 4th and early 5th centuries as barbarian raids and a desire to avoid taxation pushed rural populations into cities. Since Homeric times, there were several categories of poverty. The tochos, passive poor, was lower than the peens, active poor. They formed the majority of the infamous Constantinopolitan mob whose function was similar to the mob of the First Rome. However, while there are instances of riots attributed to the poor, the majority of civil disturbances were specifically attributable to the various factions of the Hippodrome like the Greens and Blues. The poor made up a non-negligible percentage of the population, but they influenced the Christian society of Byzantium to create a large network of hospitals iatreia, iatreia and almshouses, and a religious and social model largely justified by the existence of the poor and born out of the Christian transformation of classical society. <laughs> Peasantry There are no reliable figures as to the numbers of the peasantry, yet it is widely assumed that the vast majority of Byzantines lived in rural and agrarian areas. In the Taktika of Emperor Leo VI the Wise R. 886 the two professions defined as the backbone of the state are the peasantry Georgike, Georgike, farmers, and the soldiers Strasiotik, the reason for this was that besides producing most of the empire's food the peasants also produced most of its taxes. Peasants lived mostly in villages, whose name changed slowly from the classical Kome, Kome to the modern Koryo. Koryo. While agriculture and herding were the dominant occupations of villagers they were not the only ones. 
There are records for the small town of Lampsacos, situated on the eastern shore of the Hellespont, which out of 173 households classifies 113 as peasant and 60 as urban, which indicate other kinds of ancillary activities. The Treatise on Taxation, preserved in the Bibliotheca Marciana in Venice, distinguishes between three types of rural settlements the Corian, Greek, Corian or village, the Agridian, Greek, Agridian or hamlet, and the Prostion, Greek, Prostion or estate. According to a 14th-century survey of the village of Ephedos, donated to the monastery of Chilander, the average size of a landholding is only 3.5 modioi 0.08 hectares. Taxes placed on rural populations included the Kapnikan Greek, Kapnikan or hearth tax, the Sinan Greek, Sinan or cash payment frequently affiliated with the Kapnikan, the Enomian Greek, Enomian or pasture tax, and the Arakan Greek, Arakan meaning, of the air which depended on the village's population and ranged between 4 and 20 gold coins annually. Their diet consisted of mainly grains and beans and in fishing communities fish was usually substituted for meat. Bread, wine, and olives were important staples of Byzantine diet with soldiers on campaign eating double-baked and dried bread called paximadian Greek. As in antiquity and modern times, the most common cultivations in the Korophia Greek, Korophia were olive groves and vineyards. While Liutprand of Cremona, a visitor from Italy, found Greek wine irritating as it was often flavored with resin most other Westerners admired Greek wines, Cretan in particular being famous, while both hunting and fishing were common, the peasants mostly hunted to protect their herds and crops. Apiculture, the keeping of bees, was as highly developed in Byzantium as it had been in ancient Greece. Aside from agriculture, the peasants also labored in the crafts, fiscal inventories mentioning smiths Greek, chakias chakias, tailors Greek, raptis rapts, and cobblers Greek, zangarios zangarios. <inaudible> <inaudible> Soldiers During the Byzantine millennium, hardly a year passed without a military campaign. Soldiers were a normal part of everyday life, much more so than in modern Western societies. While it is difficult to draw a distinction between Roman and Byzantine soldiers from an organizational aspect, it is easier to do so in terms of their social profile. The military handbooks known as the Tactica continued a Hellenistic and Roman tradition, and contain a wealth of information about the appearance, customs, habits, and life of the soldiers. As with the peasantry, many soldiers performed ancillary activities, like medics and technicians. Selection for military duty was annual with yearly call ups, and great stock was placed on military exercises during the winter months, which formed a large part of a soldier's life. Until the 11th century, the majority of the conscripts were from rural areas, while the conscription of craftsmen and merchants is still an open question. From then on, professional recruiting replaced conscription, and the increasing use of mercenaries in the army was ruinous for the treasury. From the 10th century onwards, there were laws connecting land ownership and military service. While the state never allotted land for obligatory service, soldiers could and did use their pay to buy landed estates, and taxes would be decreased or waived in some cases. What the state did allocate to soldiers, however, from the 12th century onwards, were the tax revenues from some estates called pronoiae. As in antiquity, the basic food of the soldier remained the dried biscuit bread, though its name had changed from Bukalatan to Paximadian. Teachers Byzantine education was the product of an ancient Greek educational tradition that stretched back to the 5th century BC. It comprised a tripartite system of education that, taking shape during the Hellenistic era, was maintained, with inevitable changes, up until the fall of Constantinople. The stages of education were the elementary school, where pupils ranged from 6 to 10 years, secondary school, where pupils ranged from 10 to 16, and higher education. Elementary education was widely available throughout most of the Byzantine Empire's existence, in towns and occasionally in the countryside. This, in turn, ensured that literacy was much more widespread than in Western Europe, at least until the 12th century. Secondary education was confined to the larger cities while higher education was the exclusive provenance of Constantinople. Though not a society of mass literacy like modern societies, Byzantine society was a profoundly literate one. 
Based on information from an extensive array of Byzantine documents from different periods i.e. homilies, eclaga, etc., Robert Browning concluded that, while books were luxury items and functional literacy reading and writing was widespread, but largely confined to cities and monasteries, access to elementary education was provided in most cities for much of the time and sometimes in villages. Nikolaus Oikonomides, focusing on 13th-century Byzantine literacy in Western Asia Minor, states that Byzantine society had a completely literate church, an almost completely literate aristocracy, some literate horsemen, rare literate peasants and almost completely illiterate women. Ioannis Storitis estimates that the percentage of the empire's population with some degree of literacy was at most 15-20% based primarily on the mention of illiterate Byzantine Tormarchai in the Tactica of Emperor Leo VI the Wise r. 886-912. In Byzantium, the elementary school teacher occupied a low social position and taught mainly from simple fairy tale books Aesop's fables were often used. However, the grammarian and rhetorician, teachers responsible for the following two phases of education, were more respected. These used classical Greek texts like Homer's Iliad or Odyssey and much of their time was taken with detailed word-for-word -word explication. Books were rare and very expensive and likely only possessed by teachers who dictated passages to students. Topic. Women. Women have tended to be overlooked in Byzantine studies as Byzantine society left few records about them. Women were disadvantaged in some aspects of their legal status and in their access to education, and limited in their freedom of movement. The life of a Byzantine Greek woman could be divided into three phases, girlhood, motherhood, and widowhood. Childhood was brief and perilous, even more so for girls than boys. Parents would celebrate the birth of a boy twice as much and there is some evidence of female infanticide i.e. roadside abandonment and suffocation, though it was contrary to both civil and canon law. Educational opportunities for girls were few, they did not attend regular schools but were taught in groups at home by tutors. With few exceptions, education was limited to literacy and the Bible. A famous exception is the Princess Anna Komnene (1083–1153), whose Alexia displays a great depth of erudition, and the renowned 9th-century Byzantine poet and composer Cassiani. The majority of a young girl's daily life would be spent in household and agrarian chores, preparing herself for marriage. For most girls, childhood came to an end with the onset of puberty, which was followed shortly after by betrothal and marriage. Although marriage arranged by the family was the norm, romantic love was not unknown. Most women bore many children but few survived infancy, and grief for the loss of a loved one was an inalienable part of life. The main form of birth control was abstinence, and while there is evidence of contraception it seems to have been mainly used by prostitutes. Due to prevailing norms of modesty, women would wear clothing that covered the whole of their body except their hands. While women among the poor sometimes wore sleeveless tunics, most women were obliged to cover even their hair with the long mephorion veil. Women of means, however, spared no expense in adorning their clothes with exquisite jewelry and fine silk fabrics. Divorces were hard to obtain even though there were laws permitting them. Husbands would often beat their wives, though the reverse was not unknown, as in Theodore Prodromos's description of a battered husband in the Tocha Prodromos poems. Although female life expectancy in Byzantium was lower than that of men, due to death in childbirth, wars, and the fact that men married younger, female widowhood was still fairly common. Still, some women were able to circumvent societal strictures and work as traders, artisans, abbots, entertainers, and scholars. Entrepreneurs The traditional image of Byzantine Greek merchants as unenterprising benefactors of state aid is beginning to change for that of mobile, pro-active agents. The merchant class, particularly that of Constantinople, became a force of its own that could, at times, even threaten the emperor as it did in the 11th and 12th centuries. This was achieved through efficient use of credit and other monetary innovations. Merchants invested surplus funds in financial products called creacoinonia, creacoinonia the equivalent and perhaps ancestor of the later Italian commenda. Eventually, the purchasing power of Byzantine merchants became such that it could influence prices in markets as far afield as Cairo and Alexandria. In reflection of their success, emperors gave merchants the right to become members of the Senate, that is to integrate themselves with the ruling elite. 
This had an end by the end of the 11th century when political machinations allowed the landed aristocracy to secure the throne for a century and more. Following that phase, however, the enterprising merchants bounced back and wielded real clout during the time of the Third Crusade. The reason Byzantine Greek merchants have often been neglected in historiography is not that they were any less able than their ancient or modern Greek colleagues in matters of trade. It rather originated with the way history was written in Byzantium, which was often under the patronage of their competitors, the court, and land aristocracy. The fact that they were eventually surpassed by their Italian rivals is attributable to the privileges sought and acquired by the Crusader states within the Levant and the dominant maritime violence of the Italians. Clergy <inaudible> 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 Unlike in Western Europe where priests were clearly demarcated from the laymen, the clergy of the Eastern Roman Empire remained in close contact with the rest of society. Readers and subdeacons were drawn from the laity and expected to be at least 20 years of age while priests and bishops had to be at least 30. Unlike the Latin Church, the Byzantine Church allowed married priests and deacons, as long as they were married before ordination. Bishops, however, were required to be unmarried. While the religious hierarchy mirrored the empire's administrative divisions, the clergy were more ubiquitous than the emperor's servants. The issue of Caesaropapism, while usually associated with the Byzantine Empire, is now understood to be an oversimplification of actual conditions in the empire. By the 5th century, the Patriarch of Constantinople was recognized as first among equals of the four Eastern Patriarchs and as of equal status with the Pope in Rome. The ecclesiastical provinces were called eparchies and were headed by archbishops or metropolitans who supervised their subordinate bishops or episcopoi. For most people, however, it was their parish priest or papas from the Greek word for father that was the most recognizable face of the clergy. Culture Language The Eastern Roman Empire was in language and civilization a Greek society. Linguistically, Byzantine or medieval Greek is situated between the Hellenistic and modern phases of the language. Since as early as the Hellenistic era, Greek had been the lingua franca of the educated elites of the Eastern Mediterranean, spoken natively in the Southern Balkans, the Greek islands, Asia Minor, and the ancient and Hellenistic Greek colonies of Southern Italy, the Black Sea, Western Asia and North Africa. At the beginning of the Byzantine millennium, the coin Greek, coin remained the basis for spoken Greek and Christian writings, while Attic Greek was the language of the philosophers and orators. As Christianity became the dominant religion, Attic began to be used in Christian writings in addition to and often interspersed with coin Greek. Nonetheless, from the 6th at least until the 12th century, Attic remained entrenched in the educational system, while further changes to the spoken language can be postulated for the early and middle Byzantine periods. The population of the Byzantine Empire, at least in its early stages, had a variety of mother tongues including Greek. These included Latin, Aramaic, Coptic, and Caucasian languages, while Cyril Mango also cites evidence for bilingualism in the south and southeast. These influences, as well as an influx of people of Arabic, Celtic, Germanic, Turkic, and Slavic backgrounds, supplied medieval Greek with many loanwords that have survived in the modern Greek language. From the 11th century onward, there was also a steady rise in the literary use of the vernacular. Following the Fourth Crusade, there was increased contact with the West, and the lingua franca of commerce became Italian. In the areas of the Crusader kingdoms a classical education Greek, paideia paideia ceased to be a sine qua non of social status, leading to the rise of the vernacular. From this era many beautiful works in the vernacular, often written by people deeply steeped in classical education, are attested. A famous example is the four tochaprodromic poems attributed to Theodorus Prodromos. From the 13th to the 15th centuries, the last centuries of the empire, there arose several works, including laments, fables, romances, and chronicles, written outside Constantinople, which until then had been the seat of most literature, in an idiom termed by scholars as Byzantine coin. However, the diglossia of the Greek-speaking world, which had already started in ancient Greece, continued under Ottoman rule and persisted in the modern Greek state until 1976, although Koine Greek remains the official language of the Greek Orthodox Church. 
As shown in the poems of Tochiprodromos, an early stage of modern Greek had already been shaped by the 12th century and possibly earlier. Vernacular Greek continued to be known as Romaic, Roman, until the 20th century. Religion At the time of Constantine the Great r. 306 to 337, barely 10% of the Roman Empire's population were Christians, with most of them being urban population and generally found in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. The majority of people still honored the old gods in the public Roman way of religio. As Christianity became a complete philosophical system, whose theory and apologetics were heavily indebted to the classic word, this changed. In addition, Constantine, as Pontifex Maximus, was responsible for the correct cultus or veneratio of the deity which was in accordance with former Roman practice. The move from the old religion to the new entailed some elements of continuity as well as break with the past, though the artistic heritage of paganism was literally broken by Christian zeal, Christianity led to the development of a few phenomena characteristic of Byzantium. Namely, the intimate connection between church and state, a legacy of Roman cultus. Also, the creation of a Christian philosophy that guided Byzantine Greeks in their everyday lives. And finally, the dichotomy between the Christian ideals of the Bible and classical Greek paideia which could not be left out, however, since so much of Christian scholarship and philosophy depended on it. These shaped Byzantine Greek character and the perceptions of themselves and others. Christians at the time of Constantine's conversion made up only 10% of the population. This would rise to 50% by the end of the 4th century and 90% by the end of the 5th century. Emperor Justinian I R. 527 then brutally mopped up the rest of the pagans, highly literate academics on one end of the scale and illiterate peasants on the other. A conversion so rapid seems to have been rather the result of expediency than of conviction. The survival of the empire in the east assured an active role of the emperor in the affairs of the church. The Byzantine state inherited from pagan times the administrative and financial routine of organizing religious affairs, and this routine was applied to the Christian church. Following the pattern set by Eusebius of Caesarea, the Byzantines viewed the emperor as a representative or messenger of Christ, responsible particularly for the propagation of Christianity among pagans, and for the externals of the religion, such as administration and finances. The imperial role in the affairs of the church never developed into a fixed, legally defined system, however, with the decline of Rome, and internal dissension in the other eastern patriarchates, the Church of Constantinople became, between the 6th and 11th centuries, the richest and most influential center of Christendom. Even when the Byzantine Empire was reduced to only a shadow of its former self, the church, as an institution, exercised so much influence both inside and outside the imperial frontiers as never before. As George Ostrogorsky points out, the Patriarchate of Constantinople remained the center of the Orthodox world, with subordinate metropolitan sees and archbishoprics in the territory of Asia Minor and the Balkans, now lost to Byzantium, as well as in Caucasus, Russia and Lithuania. The Church remained the most stable element in the Byzantine Empire. In terms of religion, Byzantine Greek Macedonia is also significant as being the home of Saints Cyril and Methodius, two Greek brothers from Thessaloniki Salonika, who were sent on state-sponsored missions to proselytize among the Slavs of the Balkans and East Central Europe. This involved Cyril and Methodius having to translate the Christian Bible into the Slavs' own language, for which they invented an alphabet that became known as Old Church Slavonic. In the process, this cemented the Greek brothers' status as the pioneers of Slavic literature and those who first introduced Byzantine civilization and Orthodox Christianity to the hitherto illiterate and pagan Slavs. Identity Self-perception In modern Byzantine scholarship, there are currently three main schools of thought on medieval Eastern Roman identity. First, a school of thought that developed largely under the influence of modern Greek nationalism, treats Roman identity as the medieval form of a perennial Greek national identity. In this view, as heirs to the ancient Greeks and Romans, the Byzantines thought of themselves as Romoioi, or Romans, though they knew that they were ethnically Greeks. 
Second, which could be regarded as preponderant in the field considers Romanity, the mode of self-identification of the subjects of a multi-ethnic empire at least up to the 12th century, where the average subject identified as Roman. Third, a line of thought argues that the Eastern Roman identity was a separate pre-modern national identity. The established consensus in the field of Byzantine studies does not call into question the self-identification of the Byzantines. As Romans, the defining traits of being considered one of the Romoioi were being an Orthodox Christian and more importantly speaking Greek, characteristics which had to be acquired by birth if one was not to be considered an Allogenes or even a barbarian. The term mostly used to describe someone who was a foreigner to both the Byzantines and their state was ethnikos, Greek, ethnikos a term which originally described non-Jews or non-Christians, but had lost its religious meaning. In a classicizing vein usually applied to other peoples, Byzantine authors regularly referred to their people as Ausones, an ancient name for the original inhabitants of Italy. Most historians agree that the defining features of their civilization were, 1 Greek language, culture, literature, and science, 2 Roman law and tradition, 3 Christian faith. The Byzantine Greeks were, and perceived themselves as, heirs to the culture of ancient Greece, the political heirs of imperial Rome, and followers of the apostles. Thus, their sense of Romanity was different from that of their contemporaries in the West. Romaic was the name of the vulgar Greek language, as opposed to Hellenic, which was its literary or doctrinal form. Being a Roman was mostly a matter of culture and religion rather than speaking Greek or living within Byzantine territory, and had nothing to do with race. Some Byzantines began to use the name Greek Helen with its ancient meaning of someone living in the territory of Greece rather than its usually Christian meaning of pagan. Realizing that the restored empire held lands of ancient Greeks and had a population largely descended from them, some scholars such as George Gemistos Plethon and John Argyropoulos put emphasized pagan Greek and Christian Roman past, mostly during in a time of Byzantine political decline. However such views were part of a few learned people, and the majority of Byzantine Christians would see them as nonsensical or dangerous. After 1204 the Byzantine successor entities were mostly Greek-speaking but not nation-states like France and England of that time. The risk or reality of foreign rule, not some sort of Greek national consciousness was the primary element that drew contemporary Byzantines together. Byzantine elites and common people nurtured a high self-esteem based on their perceived cultural superiority towards foreigners, whom they viewed with contempt, despite the frequent occurrence of compliments to an individual foreigner as an Andrios Romaiophron, Andrios Romaiophron roughly, a brave Roman-minded fellow. There was always an element of indifference or neglect of everything non-Greek, which was therefore, barbarian. Official discourse In official discourse, "...all inhabitants of the empire were subjects of the emperor, and therefore Romans." Thus the primary definition of Romeos was, "...political or statist." In order to succeed in being a full-blown and unquestioned, "...Roman," it was best to be a Greek Orthodox Christian and a Greek speaker, at least in one's public persona. Yet, the cultural uniformity which the Byzantine Church and the state pursued through orthodoxy and the Greek language was not sufficient to erase distinct identities, nor did it aim to. <laughs> Regional identity Often one's local geographic identity could outweigh one's identity as a Romeos. The terms Zenos Greek, Zenos and Exoticos Greek, Exoticos denoted people foreign to the local population, regardless of whether they were from abroad or from elsewhere within the Byzantine Empire. When a person was away from home he was a stranger and was often treated with suspicion. A monk from Western Asia Minor who joined a monastery in Pontus was disparaged and mistreated by everyone as a stranger. The corollary to regional solidarity was regional hostility. Revival of Hellenism From an evolutionary standpoint, Byzantium was a multi-ethnic empire that emerged as a Christian empire, soon comprised the Hellenized Empire of the East, and ended its thousand-year history, in 1453, as a Greek Orthodox state, an empire that became a nation, almost by the modern meaning of the word. 
The presence of a distinctive and historically rich literary culture was also very important in the division between Greek, East and Latin, West and thus the formation of both. It was a multi-ethnic empire where the Hellenic element was predominant, especially in the later period, spoken language and state, the markers of identity that were to become a fundamental tenet of 19th-century nationalism throughout Europe became, by accident, a reality during a formative period of medieval Greek history. After the empire lost non-Greek-speaking territories in the 7th and 8th centuries, Greek, Ellen when not used to signify, pagan, became synonymous with, Roman. Romeos and Christian Christianos to mean a Christian Greek citizen of the Eastern Roman Empire, in the context of increasing Venetian and Genoese power in the Eastern Mediterranean. Association with Hellenism took deeper root among the Byzantine elite, on account of a desire to distinguish themselves from the Latin West and to lay legitimate claims to Greek speaking lands. From the 12th century onwards, Byzantine Roman writers started to disassociate themselves from the empire's pre constantinian and Latin past, regarding henceforth the transfer of the Roman capital to Constantinople by Constantine as their founding moment and reappraised the normative value of the pagan Hellenes, even though the latter were still viewed as a group distinct from the Byzantines. The first time the term, Hellene, was used to mean, Byzantine. In official correspondence was in a letter to Emperor Manuel I Comnenus Beginning in the 12th century and especially after 1204, certain Byzantine Greek intellectuals began to use the ancient Greek ethnonym Ellen, Greek, Ellen in order to describe Byzantine civilization. After the fall of Constantinople to the Crusaders in 1204, a small circle of the elite of the Empire of Nicaea used the term Hellene as a term of self-identification. For example, in a letter to Pope Gregory IX, the Nicene Emperor John III Doukas Vaditses claimed to have received the gift of royalty from Constantine the Great, and put emphasis on his «Hellenic» descent, exalting the wisdom of the Greek people. He was presenting Hellenic culture as an integral part of the Byzantine polity in defiance of Latin claims. Emperor Theodore II Lascaris r. 1254 the only one during this period to systematically employ the term Hellene as a term of self-identification, tried to revive Hellenic tradition by fostering the study of philosophy, for in his opinion there was a danger that philosophy might abandon the Greeks and seek refuge among the Latins. For historians of the court of Nicaea, however, such as George Acropolites and George Pachymeres, Romeos remained the only significant term of self-identification, despite traces of influence of the policy of the emperors of Nicaea in their writings. During the Palaiologan dynasty, after the Byzantines recaptured Constantinople, Romoioi became again dominant as a term for self-description, and there are few traces of Hellene, such as in the writings of George Gemistos Plethon, the Neo-Platonic philosopher boasted. We are Hellenes by race and culture, and proposed a reborn Byzantine Empire following a utopian Hellenic system of government centered in mistress. Under the influence of Plethon, John Argyropoulos addressed Emperor John VIII Palaiologos R. 1425-1448 as Son King of Hellas, and urged the last Byzantine Emperor, Constantine XI Palaiologos R. 1449-1453, to proclaim himself King of the Hellenes. These largely rhetorical expressions of Hellenic identity were confined in a very small circle and had no impact on the people. They were however continued by Byzantine intellectuals who participated in the Italian Renaissance. <laughs> Western perception In the eyes of the West, after the coronation of Charlemagne, the Byzantines were not acknowledged as the inheritors of the Roman Empire. Byzantium was rather perceived to be a corrupted continuation of ancient Greece, and was often derided as the Empire of the Greeks, or Kingdom of Greece. Such denials of Byzantium's Roman heritage and ecumenical rights would instigate the first resentments between Greeks and Latins for the Latin liturgical rite or Franks. For Charlemagne's ethnicity, as they were called by the Greeks, popular Western opinion is reflected in the Translatio Militiae, whose anonymous Latin author states that the Greeks had lost their courage and their learning, and therefore did not join in the war against the infidels. In another passage, the ancient Greeks are praised for their military skill and their learning, by which means the author draws a contrast with contemporary Byzantine Greeks, who were generally viewed as a non-warlike and schismatic people. 
While this reputation seems strange to modern eyes given the unceasing military operations of the Byzantines and their 8th century struggle against Islam and Islamic states, it reflects the realpolitik sophistication of the Byzantines, who employed diplomacy and trade as well as armed force in foreign policy, and the high level of their culture in contrast to the zeal of the Crusaders and the ignorance and superstition of the medieval West. As historian Stephen Runciman has put it, Ever since our rough crusading forefathers first saw Constantinople and met, to their contemptuous disgust, a society where everyone read and wrote, ate food with forks and preferred diplomacy to war, it has been fashionable to pass the Byzantines by with scorn and to use their name as synonymous with decadence." A turning point in how both sides viewed each other is probably the massacre of Latins in Constantinople in 1182. The massacre followed the deposition of Maria of Antioch, a Norman Frankish therefore Latin princess who was ruling as regent to her infant son Emperor Alexios II Komnenos. Maria was deeply unpopular due to the heavy-handed favoritism that had been shown the Italian merchants during the regency and popular celebrations of her downfall by the citizenry of Constantinople quickly turned to rioting and massacre. The event and the horrific reports of survivors inflamed religious tensions in the West, leading to the retaliatory sacking of Thessalonica, the empire's second largest city, by William II of Sicily. An example of Western opinion at the time is the writings of William of Tyre, who described the Greek nation as a brood of vipers, like a serpent in the bosom or a mouse in the wardrobe evilly requite their guests. Eastern perception In the East, the Persians and Arabs continued to regard the Eastern Roman Byzantine Greeks as «Romans» Arabic, ar -rum after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, for instance, the 30th surah of the Quran ar -rum refers to the defeat of the Byzantines «Rum» or «Romans» under Heraclius by the Persians at the Battle of Antioch 613, and promises an eventual Byzantine Roman victory. This traditional designation of the Byzantines as Eastern Romans in the Muslim world continued through the Middle Ages, leading to names such as the Sultanate of Rum, Sultanate over the Romans, in conquered Anatolia and personal names such as Rumi, the mystical Persian poet who lived in formerly Byzantine Konya in the 1200s. Late medieval Arab geographers still saw the Byzantines as Rum Romans, not as Greeks, for instance Ibn Battuta saw the, then collapsing, Rum as pale continuators and successors of the ancient Greeks Yunani in matters of culture." The Muslim Ottomans also referred to their Byzantine Greek rivals as Rum Romans, and that term is still in official use in Turkey for the Greek-speaking natives Rumler of Istanbul cf. Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople Turkish, Rum Orthodox Patrikanesi, Roman Orthodox Patriarchate. Many place names in Anatolia derive from this Turkish word Rum. Romans. For the Byzantines, Erzurum, Arzon of the Romans, Rumelia, Land of the Romans, and Rumie i Sugra, Little Rome, the region of Amasya and Shivas. <laughs> Post-Byzantine history Byzantine Greeks, forming the majority of the Byzantine Empire proper at the height of its power, gradually came under the dominance of foreign powers with the decline of the empire during the Middle Ages. Those who came under Arab Muslim rule, either fled their former lands or submitted to the new Muslim rulers, receiving the status of dhimmi. Over the centuries these surviving Christian societies of former Byzantine Greeks in Arab realms evolved into Antiochian Greeks, Melkitas or merged into the societies of Arab Christians, existing to this day. The majority of Byzantine Greeks lived in Asia Minor, the Southern Balkans, and Aegean Islands. Nearly all of these Byzantine Greeks fell under Turkish Muslim rule by the 16th century. Many retained their identities, eventually comprising the modern Greek and Cypriot states as well as the Cappadocian Greek and Pontic Greek minorities in Asia Minor. Other Byzantine Greeks, particularly in Anatolia, converted to Islam and underwent Turkification over time, other than the Western term, Grykoi, Greeks, which was not in common use, but used as a term of self-designation up to the 19th century by scholars and small numbers of people related to the West, the modern Greek people still use the Byzantine term, Romoioi, or Romioi, Romans, 
to refer to themselves, as well as the term Romaic, Roman, to refer to their modern Greek language. Many Greek Orthodox populations, particularly those outside the newly independent modern Greek state, continued to refer to themselves as Romeoi, i.e., Romans, Byzantines, well into the 20th century. Peter Chiranis, born on the island of Lemnos in 1908 and later became a professor of Byzantine history at Rutgers University, recounts that when the island was taken from the Ottomans by Greece in 1912, Greek soldiers were sent to each village and stationed themselves in the public squares. Some of the island children ran to see what Greek soldiers looked like. What are you looking at? One of the soldiers asked. At Helene's, the children replied. Are you not Helene's yourselves? The soldier retorted. No, we are Romans, the children replied. See also Ethnic, religious and political formations <laughs>